You know the drill. I'm your host Yusuf, and these are 10 scariest criminals in the United States that are alive today. Make sure you subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Anyways, let's hope this project doesn't crash while editing. Number 10, Kenneth Eugene Barrett. Kenneth Eugene Barrett, who is 59, was convicted in 2005 in the shooting of trooper David Rocky Eels, who took part in the multi-agency raid. An autopsy revealed Eels was struck by three bullets as law enforcers mounted the assault on Barrett's Sequoia County home. In 2015, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals ordered that a hearing be held in the U.S. District Court of Eastern Oklahoma to determine whether Barrett's trial lawyers failed to effectively assist Barrett with his defense. Trial lawyers failed to investigate Barrett's background and mental health, which might have provided evidence that would have persuaded jurors to impose a sentence other than the execution penalty. A magistrate judge held a a seven day hearing in 2017, which included testimony from defense experts who said Barrett suffered from brain damage and bipolar disorder and experienced a chaotic and abusive childhood. The magistrate judge recommended a new sentencing hearing be conducted. U.S. District Judge Ronald A. White in a 2019 ruling found that while Barrett's lawyers may have been deficient, their mistakes did not harm his legal rights. White decided there was no need to reconsider Barrett's sentence, and Barrett appealed to the decision. A three-judge panel of 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals determined a reasonable probability existed that at least one juror would have struck a different balance, had they been given the opportunity to weigh the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. In the 65 page opinion, the panel concludes the absence of this readily available mitigation evidence during sentencing left the jury with no explanation other than a characterization presented by prosecutors. Despite our suggestion that the government could reboot Mr. Barrett's mental health evidence if it could show that he was a psychopath and would be at a high risk of committing violent offenses if freed. The judges state referencing an opinion in a prior appeal filed by Barrett. The government introduced no such evidence at the evidentiary hearing and it did not argue Mr. Barrett's evidence would have this double-edged effect. Number 9, Brandon Basham. In 2002, Basham, a lifelong Kentucky resident, was serving the final years of a felony forgery conviction sentence at the Hopkins County Detention Center in Kentucky. In October of that year, Chadrick Evan Folks became Basham's new cellmate. In early November, Folks was charged with an additional and serious state offense, first degree abuse. On November 4th, 2002, Basham and Folks escaped the detention center together by scaling a wall in the recreation area and leaving the area on foot. By the evening of November 5th, Basham and Folks reached the home of James Hawkins in nearby Hanson, Kentucky. Basham approached the dwelling, knocked on the door, and asked to use the telephone. Basham told Hawkins that his car had broken down, and after Basham made two calls, Hawkins agreed to drive him to a nearby convenience store. Folks joined them and the three men left in Hawkins' truck. The two men then told Hawkins that their vehicle was disabled in Robards, Kentucky, and they asked for a ride. During the drive, Folks told Hawkins that the disabled vehicle was actually in Indiana and directed Hawkins to drive there. Folks later changed the directions again. By this point, Basham was pointing a knife at Hawkins to keep him driving to their preferred location. At some point, Folks took the wheel, drove the truck into a field, and ordered Basham to tie Hawkins to a tree. Folks became dissatisfied with Basham's speed and eventually completed the job himself. They left Hawkins clothed in shorts, flip-flops, and short-sleeved vests. Fifteen hours later, Hawkins freed himself and flagged a passing motorist. When interviewed by police officers later that day, Hawkins identified Basham and Folks as the individuals who kidnapped him. Number 8, Wesley Kuntz. Wesley Paul Kuntz Jr. was already in prison for kidnapping and carjacking when he took part in the slaughter of another federal inmate along with co-defendant Charles Michael Hall. Hall was a decade older than Kuntz, with an IQ about 30 points higher, the dissent notes. It was Hall who bound, gagged, and blindfolded Victor Castro Rodriguez. Hall consistently asserted that he had ended Castro by standing on his neck and suffocating him. Kuntz, however, immediately claimed responsibility for the ending, but the condemned man's troubles started long before that fateful day. Sotomayor explains in detail, Kuntz's childhood was marked by emotional, physical, and intimate abuse. He cycled through child psychiatric institutions beginning at age four. He entered the Texas juvenile system at age 11. While in juvenile custody, he cuts his own body and had to be restrained so he would not further harm himself. He was sentenced to adult prison at age 17, where he continued to engage in self 
self-mutilation. At age 20, after Kuntz's release from state prison, he suffered a traumatic brain injury. Kuntz broke multiple facial bones, experiencing bleeding around the brain, and briefly entered a coma. His IQ plummeted from average into the range of intellectual disability. The crux of the facts relayed by the dissent, however, is not to make people feel particularly sorry for the admitted butcher. Rather, Sotomayor, jointed by Justices Stephen Breyer and Alina Kagan, has marshaled the timeline during which Kuntz likely obtained his apparent intellectual disability in order to argue that the conservative majority on the high court has abandoned a commitment to the US Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Number 7, Marvin Gabrion. Marvin Charles Gabrion is an American slaughterer, abuser, and suspected serial butcher convicted of the 1997 kidnapping and slaughter of 19-year-old Rachel Timmerman of Cedar Springs, Michigan. Timmerman and her daughter Shannon disappeared two days before Gabrion was set to stand trial on abuse charges filed by Rachel the previous summer. Rachel's body was found in Oxford Lake, weighted down by cinder blocks. Shannon remained missing, but is presumed deceased. Although Gabrion was not tried for ending Shannon, court documents describe her slaughter as virtually undisputed. Gabrion is also the prime suspect in the disappearances and slaughters of several other people, including an additional witness who was said to testify against him in the trial for abuse. His handyman, another potential witness and family friend, and an unknown man. The bodies of these people who were witnesses to his case are yet to be found, but various items belonging to them were recovered from his home. The case received national attention both for the brutality of the crime and for the controversial sentence. Michigan abolished the demise penalty in 1846, but Timmerman's body was found within the Huron Manistee National Forests, a federal government owned forest. The slaughter was therefore also a violation of US federal law, which authorizes the demise penalty irrespective of local state law. Gabrion, who was tried in the US District Court for the Western District of Michigan, thus is the first person sentenced to execution by a federal court located in a non-execution penalty state since the federal execution penalty was reinstated in 1988. Number 6, Len Davis. Davis was known in the community as Robocop because of his large size and his desire due to his aggressive policing style. He had been suspended six times and received 20 complaints between 1987 and 1992, while subsequently receiving the department's Medal of Merit in 1993. In 1994, an FBI sting caught Davis enforcing a protection racket upon the city's substance dealers. Davis had extorted protection money from a substance dealer who was an FBI informant. Nine other police officers, including two who would later testify against Davis, were later indicted for being part of a criminal conspiracy with Davis. 20 additional New Orleans police officers were also implicated in the scheme, but the investigation had to be aborted due to the slaughter of Kim Groves. Davis would later be convicted of additional substance related charges, while the other officers pleaded guilty. In 1994, Davis beat a young man in New Orleans, mistaking him for a suspect in a police officer's shooting. Kim Groves, a 32 year old local resident and mother of three young children, witnessed the assault and filed a complaint with the New Orleans Police Department. Davis was tipped off about the complaint by another officer and then conspired with a local substance dealer, Paul Hardy, to end Groves. Hardy shot and ended her on October 14, 1994, less than one day after she filed the complaint. A third man, Damon Causey, hid the slaughter weapon, a 9mm pistol. Davis was convicted in 1996 on two federal civil rights charges for directing Hardy to slaughter Groves and for witness tampering. Davis was initially sentenced to execution on April 26, 1996. The Fifth Circuit, however, reversed his execution sentence when his conviction for witness tampering was thrown out. A subsequent jury also chose the execution penalty for Davis, and he was formally sentenced to execution again on October 27, 2005. Number 5, Kaboni Savage. Eugene Twin Coleman, who was previously working with Savage, was arrested and put in federal custody on October 8, 2004, and agreed to testify against Savage in a substance trial. In March 2003, after Coleman slaughtered his friend, 26-year-old Tyrone Tolliver of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, federal agents encouraged Coleman's 54-year-old mother, Marcella Coleman, a prison guard at the Koran Fromhold Correctional Facility, to move to a new house. Believing that she could defend herself, she refused. Savage was convicted partly due to Coleman's testimony. In return, Savage ordered Marcella Coleman's house in North Philadelphia to be burned down. At the time, Savage was in custody at FDC Philadelphia. At about 5 a.m. on October 9, 2004, the row house was firebombed. The fire originated in a living room on the first floor, traveled quickly, and was extinguished after about 20 minutes. 
there were no survivors. It was the deadliest mass tragedy in Philadelphia since the Lex Street removals in 2000. After learning that Eugene had been temporarily released from prison to attend the funeral of his relatives, a bug in Savage's cell recorded him remarking they should stop off and get him some barbecue sauce, poured on those burnt losers. Savage's sister, Kidata Savage, known as Da or Lil Sis, helped plot this crime by recruiting Lamont Lewis, the hitman. Lewis had been previously acquitted of ending Carlton Muhammad Brown, who passed away in 2001. Lewis in turn asked Robert B.J. Merritt Jr., his cousin, to help him. Kidata Savage showed the hitman where the house was located. According to federal prosecutors, Merritt was the only one who lit a gasoline can and threw it, and another one into the house. Lewis said that both he and Merritt tossed cans into the house. Number 4. Donald Broadnax In August 1977, the 16-year-old Broadnax got into an argument with his friend, 19-year-old Gregory Manson, in the Ellerton Village public housing community. In the midst of their scuffle, Broadnax pulled out a gun and fired six shots at Manson. After emptying out his clip, Broadnax reloaded and fired three more shots into Manson's body, before finally leaving the crime scene. Approximately three months later, he was arrested and charged with first degree slaughter. The following year, he was convicted and sentenced to 99 years imprisonment, with a chance of parole after serving several years. In 1986, Broadnax was paroled and returned to Birmingham. Within the next two years, he got into contact with Raymond Godfather Mims, a notorious local substance dealer who allowed him to live in one of his houses. The property was eventually raided by the police who arrested Broadnax and seized several guns. As this was considered a violation of his parole, Broadnax was immediately returned to prison. Number 3. Carrie Spencer the slaughters that Nathaniel Woods was convicted of took place on June 17, 2004 in Birmingham, Alabama. Four police officers, Harley Chisholm III, Charles Bennett, Carl Owen, and Michael Collins stormed a crack house while Nathaniel Woods and Carrie Spencer were inside. Spencer had an SKS rifle when he heard the officers, while Woods was in the kitchen. After Woods had surrendered to the officers, Spencer came downstairs to see two officers pointing guns at him. Spencer fired shots at all four police officers, ending three of the four. Chisholm, Bennett, and Owen. The fourth officer, Michael Collins, was injured but survived. Woods ran out of the house when he heard the gunshots. Spencer and Woods were both charged with the slaughters despite Woods never firing a weapon. Spencer stated Woods was not involved and said, Nate is absolutely innocent. That man didn't know I was going to shoot anybody just like I didn't know I was going to shoot anybody that day, period. Number two, Mark Goudeau. Mark Goudeau is an American serial butcher, kidnapper, and thief. Goudeau terrorized victims in the Phoenix metro area between August 2005 and June 2006. Coincidentally, Goudeau was active at the same time as two other Phoenix serial butchers, jointly known as the Serial Shooter. In addition to committing nine slaughters, his extensive crime spree included 84 other felony crimes, totaling 93 felonies over the 10-month period. He faced two separate trials, one for 19 charges related to an attack on two sisters whom he abused and intimately assaulted, and another related to 74 more charges including slaughter, robbery, abuse, kidnapping, intimate abuse, and or assault of adults. All but one of his victims were females. Goudeau was convicted on a total of 76 of 93 crimes and was sentenced to execution nine times, one for each slaughter conviction, and given a sum total of 1,634 years in Arizona State Prison. Number one, David Carpenter. David Joseph Carpenter, aka the Trailside Butcher, is an American serial butcher and serial abuser known for stalking and slaughtering a variety of individuals on hiking trails in state parks near San Francisco, California. He attacked at least 10 individuals, with two attempted victims, Stephen Hartle and Lois Rinna, mother of television personality Lisa Rinna, surviving. Carpenter used a 38 caliber handgun in all but one of his endings. A 44 caliber handgun was used in the ending of Etta Kane on Mount Tamalpais. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and comment if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time on Crime Time.